is not only in Turkey, but um, but 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 globally, uh, we it's it's a, it's an obvious statement um, that uh, where counterterrorism is invoked, uh, the protection of of human rights is often weakened both in terms of the legal protection and in practice uh, in the uh, and in the investigation and redress and remedies that are more difficult to obtain. And that's even more so when we're speaking of violations of the rights of groups, communities that are discriminated against uh, or, or stigmatized. And, and that has also been a factor here. And this general trend in many countries, including in, in Turkey, but also elsewhere, has been highlighted uh, by many authorities, by successive UN special rapport rapporteurs on counterterrorism, as well as by NGOs like the International Commission for us. Um, and, and this case is really a stark illustration of it. Um, I think it's also striking that this counterterrorism operation apparently took place on the basis of intelligence information um, that transpired to be to be incorrect, entirely incorrect. That intelligence was was relied on apparently with very little scrutiny or, or attention to the detail and without any attempt also to apply the criminal justice process to address any uh, concerns of, uh, of terrorist crime. And um, there was no attempt to arrest anyone. And um, there was no attempt to take any other procedural or investigative steps. So the reliance on intelligence and on military means to, to address um, alleged concerns of terrorist activity um, meant that there were very few, if, if any at all, um, checks on the on the use or constraints on the on the use of legal lethal force um, in this this case, and the indeed the decision making process in terms of the the military counterterrorism operation was um, was 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 set out in the statement of the Turkish general staff that was made uh, shortly after the massacre, where it, it seemed to be quite a perfunctory process. It was simply said that it was known that there were um, terrorist organizations active in the area um, and uh, there was some drone information and that then uh, the area concerned was a route often used by terrorists um, at, at this particular time of, of night. Um, and then it said there was a discussion that an Air Force operation should be launched. Um, so, even leaving aside the possibility that the killings were deliberate, um, at minimum, an assumption was made about the nature of the group crossing the border that was incorrect, and apparently no checks, or certainly no effective checks, were applied to prevent the use of, of lethal force um, proceeding on that assumption. So how does international human rights law apply to these kinds of counterterrorism operations? Well, on international law on the right to life, um, it's very clear that counterterrorism operations require stringent safeguards all the way through the operation to limit the use of lethal force to cases of absolute necessity. And anything less than this will amount to a violation of, of the obligation by the, the state uh, as, as, as set out in, in Article 6 of the International Covenant um, uh, on, on Civil and Political Rights, uh, the right to life as set out in that article. Um, as well as the rights to life um, set out in Article 2 of the, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and in counterterrorism operations, as in other law enforcement operations, any use of lethal force can only be justified to prevent an imminent threat to life or, or, or serious injury, as the, the Human Rights Committee um, has, has, the UN Human Rights Committee has said. Um, the use of force must be in accordance with law, it must be used only exceptionally and as a last resort. And the UN Human Rights Committee has made clear that, um, in its general comment on the right to life, that what this means is that there must be procedures to ensure that law enforcement actions minimize the risk to life, that force um, and firearms are used only where absolutely necessary, where other means have been exhausted first, and where they're used in a way that's, that's proportionate. And this is also the standard applied, um, for example, in the UN basic principles on the use of firearms by law enforcement officials, again saying that law enforcement officials must first of all 
applying nonviolence means, then only then resort to force and even then must use force um, in a way that shows restraint and that minimizes the risk to, to life. So all of these obligations also apply in counterterrorism operations. Um, notwithstanding the, the rhetoric and the narrative of, of exceptionalism that is, that is often used by governments in relation to those, those operations. Um, indeed, a lot of the most important international human rights jurisprudence on the obligations of states in, re, in regard to the use of le le lethal force concerns counterterrorism operations. Um, and what this case law has emphasized is that the whole planning of a, of a counterterrorism operation, the control of it at all different levels, must be done in a way that minimizes the, the risk to life. Um, just to take some examples of cases that I think perhaps provide um, uh, good points of comparison for this, um, for this, the, for the Roboski uh, case, the um, famous case before the European Court of Human Rights of McCann versus the United Kingdom is, is illustrative, and that concerned three uh, suspected terrorists who were shot dead by the United Kingdom security forces uh, on the island of Gibraltar. And they were shot in the mistaken belief, and I think it was a genuinely mistaken belief, um, that they were on the point of detonating a remote controlled bomb. Now, in this case, in, in the McCann case, um, the, uh, the government was in a, in a better position than, than in the Roboski case because they they the the individuals who were killed in, in 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 the McCann case in fact were members of a terrorist organization and were planning a terrorist operation but they were not doing so on that particular day um, and the court found that um the 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 killings had violated the right to life um they the court found that it, in principle the use of lethal force on the basis of an honest um mistake uh, an honest but mistaken belief that there was an imminent threat to life. This could in some cases be justified. It could in principle be justified, but in this case it wasn't. And that was because there was a lack of safeguards uh, throughout the, the decision-making process in the, the operation. And there were mistakes made at different parts of the stages of the planning and control of the operation. And the court looked um, at the whole background, they looked at whether the law enforcement officials had been properly trained to use adequate restraint. They looked at how things had been planned and different levels of the command had made efforts or not to minimize the risk to, to life. And they asked questions about why there had been no attempt to arrest the suspects before uh, lethal force was used. Um, and taking all this together on the facts of that case, they found that the use of force um, had not been absolutely necessary, that uh, incorrect assumptions had been made, that there was uh, insufficient um, uh, uh, credit given to the possibility of those assumptions being wrong, um, and that the uh, training uh, provided to the officers on the ground was perhaps not sufficient. So this is instructive in relation to the, the, what happened with the operation in, in Robotsky, where certainly um, I think there, you know, those uh, that 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 care in the planning of the operation and the uh, the the, um, the making of of, of, of uh, entirely uh, incorrect assumptions uh, also applies. Um, a further case that I think maybe uh, would is, is is relevant is um, uh, the case of uh, Takieva versus Russia. This again is another case before the European Court of Human Rights, and it concerns the. Um, the, the siege by a terrorist group of the, the school at Beslan, which many people may know about, um, uh, which was a real uh, terrorist situation and a real uh, um, uh, case in which there was real threat to life that the security forces were trying to counter. But in that case, the, the, um, the security forces has, had used highly indiscriminate force and weapons that resulted in the deaths of many hostages. And this is also very relevant to Robotsky because of the, the scale and the indiscriminate nature of the, the force used in, in those killings. And in the Takieva case, 
the court found that there was a violation of the right to life because the massive use of indiscriminate weapons could not be uh, considered compatible with the standard of care needed um, in minimizing uh, the use of force. The use of explosive indiscriminate weapons carried such risk for human life that it could not, in this case, be regarded as absolutely necessary. And then again, the standard of absolute necessity has to be met. Um, and it's very difficult, I would say, to see how that standard has been met in, in Robotsky in relation to those killings. Um, given that the information on which uh, the uh, officials acted was so much more mistaken even than in the two cases I cited and that the victims were not in any way uh, involved in terrorist activity. Um, just to, I will conclude shortly, but just to, to say um, in, in terms of also how international standards apply that there, there was um, quite shortly after the, the, the massacre in Robotsky, there was a report um, issued by uh, Christoph Heinz, the then Special Rapporteur in Extrajudicial Executions. And he found, this was a report on, on, on Turkey, on many different issues in Turkey, but he addressed um, issues of, of counterterrorism operations um, amongst others. Um, and he found problems with the Turkish law as well as the practice of, of counterterrorism operations. Uh, around the time of, of Robotsky. Um, and he found that the, uh, the legal framework for counterterrorism operations contained serious ambiguities that it, for example, it failed to stipulate that the use of le lethal force should be a last resort uh, to protect life. Uh, and that the authorities um, uh, were using firearms um, directly and unhesitatingly, he said, in cases uh, where there are allegations of terrorist activity. Um, and in that regard, he raised concerns about a number of cases where civilians had been mistakenly targeted in counterterrorism, um, including uh, the Robotsky case. Um, so I, I will leave it at that. And I, of course, there are, um, this is only one aspect of the international law framework. Also, we have to think of the, the obligations to provide medical assistance, which has been mentioned that were, uh, that were apparently um, entirely disregarded in this case, and the very important uh, framework around the uh, investigation uh, and accountability in the case, which I, I hope uh, Gabriella will, will, will address more. But um, just to conclude that um, uh, clearly applying these general principles of international human rights law, that, that there are uh, enormous problems with, um, with, with the operation uh, in, this, in this case uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, aren't in any way um, uh, uh, improved by, um, by the fact that it, it happened in the framework of, of, of counterterrorism. Thank you.